necessarily. In any event, okay, so now we've got to get into the third uh, aspect of this. So it's consciousness, space aliens, and now we need to talk about uh, uh, stuff and people and, and um, matter, okay? And so some of the matter we need to talk about is uh, crystals. We can begin there. Um, so uh, Cozy Rev, this uh, astrophysicist, um, mathematics genius, Russian uh, scientist uh, of the uh, last century, uh, did a lot of work on time. And he proved all of these various aspects of time, including that it had density and um, uh, could be uh, altered and uh, could be stored and all these different kinds of things. And he wrote all these books on it. If you go to Amazon and just put in Cozy Rev, K-O-Z-Y-R-E-V, um, yeah, uh, Cozy Rev, and you'll get into his experiments. The ones you want are on time. There's another Cozy Rev there, and I think he does uh, physics. Another Russian by that name has also got books published. But the one you're after is the uh, Cozy Rev on time books. If you want to get into it, they're very dense. They're just listings of his experiments. You get the conclusions and the notes uh, throughout the book, but it's not like it's organized to provide it to you in a uh, spoon-fed fashion. So, so you got to be prepared to read scientific literature. Anyway, um, so uh, Cozy Rev made these things like uh, Cozy Rev's mirrors, which were time-effective mirrors that were made out of extremely polished aluminum. This aluminum was extremely pure. It had all kinds of um, things done to it in the smelting process. Uh, it was a very labor-intensive, and um, and this was in, in the old Soviet Union days, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And when they made these mirrors, they employed um, metallurgists, and it was quite the production, right? They had to make these, I think they made three. Uh, we read about one being successful. Um, so it's kind of hit or miss, is my understanding, but these things are sheets of aluminum uh, that were like, I think they're like nine, seven to nine feet high. I think they were nine feet high. So they were three meters, okay? They were three meters. Uh, wide, and they were st stood up on their on their ends, on the edge. But it was a long sheet of aluminum that was spiraled into a, uh, it was created and put on a roller and, and while well, it was hot and stuff and, and converted to a spiral. And then it was polished, and they just polished and polished and polished for damn ever because of the nature of aluminum oxide and getting at the underlying aluminum. And what they were after, what Cozy Red was after, was an alignment through the friction process of the polishing as well as the heat that it put in at a local level, uh, an alignment of all of the surface uh, crystals of the aluminum sheet. And uh, I think I read that he, his supposition was that they got like 58% of that when they stopped. So they got, in his estimation, with microscopic analysis, they aligned the crystals of the underlying aluminum through the, which he had to look through the aluminum oxide to get at. Uh, but they aligned the uh, crystals of 58 50 percent of all of the surface crystals in these aluminum sheets for his mirror. So I mean, they really they really worked at it. This thing went on for months. Uh, the polishing. Then they put it into the spiral, and in the middle was this telephone booth or slightly larger uh, space that humans could walk into. And then it it uh, really screwed over your mind being there because of the the effects of the uh, reflective surface and the concentration of the spiral on uh, the the on time itself. And it distorted your brain, all this other stuff. Anyway, so uh, without that, okay, so uh, leaving the mirrors aside, we focus in on the idea that he was after crystals here. He was after the reflective aspect, of, temporally reflective aspect of the surface crystals of the aluminum itself. Um, this is a continuation of Cozy Rev's interest in crystals when he discovered that he could alter time in a local environment by doing things uh, as simple as dissolving uh, crystals of sugar or salt in liquids, hot or cold. You got less time effect on uh, cold than you did on hot, hot liquids but he could actually alter the nature of time. He's, he's been able to alter the nature of time and gravity uh, by doing a number of relatively simple things uh, that basically are all focused on frequency and altering the frequency of some aspect of that thing within the um, what it's doing. So if you shake a, if you take a lead weight and uh, put it on uh, like a paint shaker, right? Uh, you know, so it just rocks back and forth and you rock it back and forth very, very rapidly with, uh, you know, maybe even less than a half an inch variation of the you know, movement of the lead weight. Uh, you can actually add more weight to it. You can make gravity react to it and make it heavier, so to speak, and that heaviness wears off over, over time. And so it is also altering, because of Cozy Rip's supposition, it's also really altering the time and that's affecting the gravity. Uh, just by shaking this thing really fast, right? We're talking about shaking it at, you know, uh, serious levels, um, uh, four and 500 oscillations per second for several minutes will produce uh, more weight in your lead weight or iron weight than you started out with. Cozy Rev also noticed that lead, which is a non-crystalline metal in terms of how it is naturally occurring, is different in accumulating uh, changes than is iron, which is crystalline in terms of how it sets up. So at some level, uh, uh, Cozy Rev discovered and discussed that crystals in and of themselves are a sign of a particular aspect of our reality, a particular aspect of the material, and that that aspect in and of itself, in the shape of the crystal, has effects within our reality. Okay, so in some cases you add time, other cases by creating crystals you reduce time in the local environment. So when you're crystallizing sugar, you're sucking time out of that local environment, so to speak. It's not time in the sense of duration. Okay? It's in time in the sense of the underlying pulse. So that, that needs to be qualified and it gets real deep when you go into it from there. Okay, so um, this is also true. And this is probably why we see uh, crystal structures throughout history, especially in our storytelling and mythos, show up as power things, right? Is because of this stuff that Cozy Rev has discovered about crystals. So, you know, so the idea that there were, you know, crystal controls in Atlantis, and you see this in the movies, and there's all these, uh, you know, big-ass crystals um, around, is, is likely because of this understanding by us um, at some level, and coming down through history, that uh, of what Cozy Rev discovered about crystals interacting with the temporal part of our material. And thus all, a lot of the other aspects, like gravity, etc.
So the um, the other aspect of what we have to consider with crystals is the pervasive nature of crystalline structures through the material. Everything sugar, sand, uh, naturally occurring, you have crystals of, um, uh, you have like uh, silicon in every one of your cells, uh, a crystalline, uh, a, a, an element that wants to be crystalline by its nature. So we find that, that there are crystalline substances everywhere. There's crystals and um, uh, the elements were forming crystals easily, even when they're circulating within our own body. And we find that various aspects of things within us are crystalline in nature, including our circulating um, melanin. Okay, uh, Melanin is the substance that gives us um, color in our skin. And uh, the more you have, the darker you're going to have a uh, skin color. Uh, melanin is, when it is expressed within our skin, a crystalline sort of a structure uh, that, that actually has a higher level of reflectivity than uh, the other substances in the cells around it, right? the plasma, etc. Uh, melanin circulates, it goes into your pineal gland, your pineal gland is the storehouse for melanin. Uh, it produces melatonin as a result of melanin levels in the circulation uh, uh, flow. Uh, you have melanin circulating in the, in the same way that you have lymph and blood circulating uh, within your system, okay, for different reasons, of course. No. So you have within you many substances that are crystalline in nature, and your brain is in fact a, uh, a quasi-crystal. It is a carbon-based uh, energy transforming device. Okay, it's organic, but it's still a device for the transformation uh, of energy. So that's and it's a superconductor because it does all of this at room temperatures. It doesn't need to be hyper cold or anything, and it's extremely fast. So it's a carbon based supercomputer, really, and it is crystalline in nature, or quasi crystals is what they call it. But there are, in fact, many crystalline elements within your, the chemistry of your brain, and you can go and research this on your own. So, um, all right, hang on, let me go back. Okay, so there's aspects of your uh, physiology, your biochemistry, uh, even the grosser aspects of things like circulating red blood cells and so on that are expressing a crystalline or quasi-crystal nature all the way up to and including your brain. Uh, it, it's a supposition in a, um, uh, a recent examination of things uh, by some uh, people engaged in consciousness uh, research and science that it may well be that the materium is using crystals in our bodies and stuff as our connection to consciousness. That it, the, And there's some supposition or some evidence that the... Um, level of uh, crystalline structures uh, within your physiology may relate to your ability to have awareness and experience um, consciousness. Okay, not that it, so there, so there may be, it may be that the materium is using uh, the crystalline state of our bodies and brains and so on as the constraints on our uh, awareness and our experience uh, of consciousness at a, a moment by moment level. Now, in that sense, there are uh, there exists the potential, at at least a theoretical level, that one could alter the crystalline nature of whatever it is that actually connects us to the uh, the source of consciousness and increase some aspect of that or attribute of that area and thus experience uh, consciousness at a, a greater level of awareness, but you're not changing the consciousness itself. And then, then okay, so uh, there's uh, there's that. Now, then we have to then I have to back up and go into this mind to machine interface stuff that we think we've discovered um, that my old parts group uh, and I think we've discovered in this ancient literature. Uh, within that. Um, literature, we find references to the experience of consciousness relative to being plugged into these machines in order to control them, and uh, specific dietary things that those in order to get a more harmonious uh, carbon-based supercomputer working their devices. Okay, A lot of these things appear to be doing, um, to be affecting those attributes of the body that, that have that more crystalline nature within them. And we see this in their altering and discussions in this literature of, of circulating melanin. So uh, so there may be some uh, uh, historic or ancient literature backing for those people that are doing investigations as into, our, into the materium and our experience of it at a consciousness level, uh, ex exploring crystals and the, that potential as a, as a connection to consciousness. So, so I can sort of <laughs> drop that one there. And, uh, and so basically we have mind crystals, right? We have crystals in the brain that are, are um, aspects of uh, uh, our experience of consciousness in our own minds and ourselves. And we note that crystals are famous for resonance and for frequency and so on. Okay, so uh, then there's another aspect of all of this stuff. Uh, one more item to note, and then I'll, I'll uh, let this, this discussion go. So the, um, the final note on the crystal stuff here is that those people that are investigating the ether, and we even see this if you read your Boscovich, uh, the last chapter in Boscovich there, um, his uh, Theory of Natural Philosophy book, you see that um, those people that are investigating the ether are describing their investigations into the ether in, in a way that is curious relative to this discussion here, in that they're saying that the um, the ether goes through sort of a stage, right? And that there's there's various different kinds of ether. There's the firmament, which is ether that doesn't move, that was mistranslated in the Bible, and the flat earthers are being hooked on it as a word salad that was created by the Department of Defense to fuck with their minds. But nonetheless, here, the, the ethereous scientists that are dissecting the ether are discovering that, that the ether... Uh, Create, the matter is created from the ether, and it goes through an intermediate stage 
that can be that they are describing as protocrystals, and that these protocrystals are arising from lattice work that assembles itself in the form of the platonic solids. And oh, by the way, it would appear that there are many more platonic solids than those few that, of which we are aware as a species. And so some of the uh, people within the ether research are in essence uh, pointing to the same kind of stuff as uh, Terence Howard in, in his patents and stuff relative to shapes um, and their function within our reality. Okay, so the uh, ethereists. Hang on, there's another one of those. Okay, sorry about that. And I don't have time to go back and edit out the um, the telephone calls and that sort of thing. Uh, just have a lot of uh, uh, interruptions here, especially on Monday. Anyway, so the uh, the ether is formed um, energetically and converts energy into matter. And that conversion process involves a uh, protocrystal, which you'd have to go and look up this stuff, the lattice work, and so on, of these um, platonic solids that uh, basically emerge and create all of matter. And so uh, that's the, the last connection there for consciousness, that even at the level of the ether, at its base, we find a crystal and structure involved in, as I say, these uh, platonic solid uh, protocrystals. Okay, and then one other note here is that in the old literature relating to the mind-machine interface, we come across an interesting, um, interesting item uh, that sort of relates to this in a sense because it was uh, discovered by way of this exploration of crystals and um, uh, the melanin and the circulating melanin and so on, trying to suss out details of the mind-to-machine interface that the Elohim, the Anunnaki, the space aliens, uh, used on humans. Anyway, uh, it turns out that there was investigations back in a day when it was, okay, so it was just like the Bible, where this stuff was written down sometimes many years, maybe centuries, after it actually happened. So, uh, you know, it's, it's estimated, well, none of the people that are mentioned in the Bible were alive at the time that it was being written. Um, any aspect of it. Okay, so, the same, same is true of the Torah. A lot of these, uh, the underlying literature appears to have been uh, touched in some way by uh, Greek. So we find even in some of the uh, pre-Sanskrit languages from which the Sanskrit script theoretically developed or evolved, we find references that are, are fundamentally Greek in their uh, in their etymology and their uh, use grammatically. So that's that's a curious thing there. Nonetheless, or, or without regard to that, the, the older literatures describe uh, civilizations in which uh, uh, things like remote viewing and uh, the various aspects of those kinds of um, uh, extrasensory perception were acknowledged and used. Okay, so you find examples of um, humans being used to do remote viewing in uh, great battles in some of the Hindu literature, uh, this, this sort of thing. Anyway, one of the uh, more systematic and scientifically focused uh, threads within all, a lot of this literature uh, has discussions about applying uh, Clear things like uh, clairvoyance, and you know, there's clear audience, etc. Hearing clearly, hearing the future, and hearing sounds and stuff from the future, that sort of thing. But they were talking about um, future seeing or uh, remote sight, so to speak, and how uh, this uh, was enhanced by these various techniques. Some of which we find in yoga today, but these techniques were described as coming from the Elohim and uh, being forced on their human subjects, right? And so, um, uh, but one of the curious parts of that is that there is a, a note that I've seen, we've seen now in several different places written in different language across different time periods that has goes to the same effect. And that is that this, that unlike, and this was interesting, unlike the Elohim and presumably some other space aliens as well, the seat of consciousness within humans, which could be located, they had us had our brains mapped down to the point where they knew exactly where within our brain the uh, mind and machine interface connected and, and how it was all functioned. And I, I know all this information and all of us old farts are uh, sworn not to reveal it. Um, uh, to inappropriate parties, right, because of the nature of this this information. But nonetheless, without regard to that, a lot of a lot of regardlesses here, um, uh, the uh, seat of consciousness of humans cannot be remote viewed. It can't be viewed in a clairvoyant fashion. And that the uh, result of doing that, whether it's done on humans or other, and that was the word used in one of this other uh, in one of this um, the, the literature that we were getting into, uh, was that it was was viewed by the um, some other beings. We don't know if it's Elohim or whoever, but it was someone that reported to an Elohim, and they were they were non-human, and they were reporting that they could not. Um, use clairvoyance and see the seat of consciousness in humans. They could see where it was located, but whenever they got into uh, looking at it, it was a basically a black hole that would just suck you right on in. And so um, just a very interesting little note about this. You know, there may be something that is uh, extraordinary uh, about the way that humanity is expressing consciousness uh, within the materium. And it was, it may be also that that was what made us attractive to the Elohim as, um, you know, carbon-based semiconductor. Uh, uh, just interesting. We're going to pursue that not being able to be remote viewed a uh, component of this and see where, where it goes. It's very difficult in all of this. Most of the literature we want to get at has not been translated. Uh, most of it has not even been scanned. So we have references to, you know, hymns and ages and people and writers and this kind of thing that it's like, well, you know, it may indeed survive in some ancient repository of books, but so far it's not available to us or, or this sort of thing. So it becomes a lot of dead ends. Nonetheless, you get these clues occasionally. So seeing it in one spot, it was quite interesting, very intriguing. And then to see it in another spot separated by probably 600 years and in a different set of circumstances and context that humans can't be, have our seat of consciousness 
well viewed and that it, it was um, uh, dangerous to try and do this, even human to human, uh, was just quite extraordinary, just very interesting. And then all of this other stuff on the seat of consciousness being perhaps uh, crystalline in nature, uh, it's just, as I say, quite curious. Anyway, guys, it's been going on long enough. I've got more phone calls and I've got some scheduled meetings here. So we'll wrap this one up.